Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Brandeis. How we doing? All right. Thank you for coming out tonight and, and braving the elements. Uh, my name is Chad Williams. I'm chair of the African and African American Studies Department, uh, and it is uh, our honor and privilege to have everyone here uh, this evening for this very special event. Uh, we are honored that you've taken the time uh, to join us uh, for this very special occasion. Social justice is at the heart of Brandeis University. Indeed, it is at the core of this university's very existence and drives our collective understanding of what makes Brandeis special. But it's often easy to lose sight of what social justice means. It can be a slippery term, encompassing much, but also, if not taken seriously, meaning very little. As a university committed to the ethos and practice of social justice, it is imperative that we constantly interrogate the meaning of social justice and explore its history, its current relevance to our everyday lives, its complexity from multiple perspectives and vantage points. This is why three years ago, Brandeis students in partnership with the International Center for Ethics, Justice, and Public Life established DICE Impact Week. It's a week-long celebration of the engagement of members of the Brandeis community, students, faculty, staff, alumni, friends, around the idea of social justice, but also an important opportunity for us to think, to mobilize, to strategize, to engage in, about, and around the work of social justice. The events taking place this week reflect the tremendous energy, creativity, and passion of our community around the work of social justice. So I'd like to first thank all the incredible student organizers of DICE Impact Week. Round of applause, please. <laughs> Thanks to Dan Terrace, director of the Ethics Center. And a special round of applause for Marcy McPhee, who has been absolutely amazing. <laughs> she deserves a vacation after this week. All right. <laughs> uh, as chair of African and African-American uh, Studies, I'm especially pleased to combine tonight's event with our annual Ruth First Memorial Lecture. The Ruth First Memorial Lecture was established in 1985 thanks to the generosity of Rose Schiff, uh, Aline Schiff Wingard, and Zena Schiff Eisenberg in memory of their daughter and sister, Louise Joy Schiff, to recognize the work of Jewish social justice activists engaged in the struggle for freedom and equality in South Africa. On the behalf of AAAS, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to the Schiff family whose support over the years has been extremely valued. Ruth First, uh, the daughter of two Latvian Jewish immigrant parents, was born in Johannesburg, South Africa in 1925. Like her parents, First was a member of the South Africa Communist Party and committed to the overthrow of the nation's apartheid regime. First established alliances with the African National Congress and in her role as a journalist, challenged the legitimacy of the South African government. Her radicalism and outspokenness resulted in her being charged with treason, banned from any public writing, and in 1963, imprisoned in isolation for 117 days. She was forced into exile, moving to London, and eventually settling in Mozambique, uh, where she continued her anti-apartheid activities. On August 17, 1982, first was assassinated by order of the South African police when she opened a letter containing an explosive device. Ruth first received her college degree from the University of Witzwatersand. And while there, she met a dynamic, uh, met a number of dynamic African students, uh, including a young man who was studying law at the time, named Nelson Mandela. Mandela's university experience and interactions with radical students like Ruth first, uh, who came from a variety of races and backgrounds, transformed him and set him on the course of becoming arguably the greatest freedom fighter in modern history. He was a revolutionary, and we should not be afraid to use this word in describing 
Nelson Mandela. Because at the heart of being a revolutionary is the ability to evolve, to change. We should all aspire to be as revolutionary as Nelson Mandela, to be able to change and evolve with our times and circumstances, but also be able to actually affect change. This year marks the 20th anniversary of one of the most remarkable moments in recent history, when for the first time South Africans of all races participated in open elections and gave birth to a new country with Nelson Mandela as president. In these 20 years, South Africa has changed in remarkable ways and has reflected broader social, political, and economic transformations taking place across the African continent. Challenges without question still exist, but a new generation of young African leaders are confronting them with a consciousness, with a creativity, with an exuberance, with a vision, with a commitment that both embraces and advances the legacy and spirit of Ruth First, of Nelson Mandela, and countless other men, women, and children who have dedicated their lives to the cause of social justice. We are truly honored and privileged to have as our DICE Impact keynote and Ruth First Memorial speakers, Indaba Mandela and Kweku Mandela, two of Nelson Mandela's grandsons, but also two of the most dynamic young leaders of Africa's future in their own right. On behalf of the organizers of DICE Impact Week and AAAS, we are thankful that you have joined us this evening. I uh, wish we could have brought you here uh, with better weather. Um, but, uh, but hopefully the warmth, the love that you have received um, over the past couple days and that you'll receive tonight uh, will make up uh, for a little bit of the harsh winter weather. Uh, so we are very excited about tonight's program. Uh, but first, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Andrew Flagel, the Senior Vice President for Students and Enrollment, who will deliver some remarks on the behalf of the Brandeis University community. So, Andrew. Thank you, Chad. Welcome and good evening. On behalf of the university, our faculty, staff, students, and particularly President Lawrence, who is with us in spirit tonight as he perhaps flies, depending on the uh, plane situation this evening, back to the area, I welcome you all to our DICE Impact keynote event, African Rising, the Mandela Legacy, and the Next Generation of African Leadership. As you know, Universities have a lot of festivals. They have a lot of celebrations. They have a lot of week-long conferences on this, that, and the other. But DICE Impact is distinctive. It is university-sponsored, but it is student-organized. And, and Professor Williams, I'll, I'll, they're not just the DICE Impact volunteers, they are the DICE Impactors, right? <laughs> to create 40 programs at a minimum with dozens more proposed in a festival of social justice unlike anything done by any college anywhere. DICE Impact incorporates the arts, music, film, international programming, global justice, ethnicity, food, and clearly, weather. It encourages us to teach, encourages us to search and teach about the meaning of social justice to learn about injustice around the world and get more involved personally in the pursuit of social justice in all its forms. Now, I'm particularly pleased to honor one of our sponsors of DICE Impact, Jules Bernstein. Many of you have had the chance to meet Jules, one of our first alumni class, the great class of 57 here at Brandeis. And Jules, through the legacy fund that he created, has funded a program called the World of Work scholarships, programs that allow our students to do internships in social justice around the country and across the world. And he also was a prime mover behind the initiation of DICE Impact, and it wouldn't have been possible without him. I got to know him well over a summer when I had a chance to spend some time with him and with my then nine-year-old son, had some really great conversations when Jules talked about his time at Brandeis and where his passion for social justice developed. And he talked in particular, much to my son's amazement, about his interaction with Martin Luther King here on campus. My son was shocked that someone knew Martin Luther King. And this interaction where Jules would actually say, and I would tell Martin, 
that he needed to do more and stop just talking about it. My son was horrified that anyone would criticize Martin Luther King. <laughs> and Jules participated in the March on Washington, as did so many of our students. And in fact, we have another alumnus with us today, Herman Hemingway from the great class of 53. Herman. Also a friend of Dr. King's and a fraternity brother of Dr. Martin Luther King. And our students got to have him on campus, got to interact with Martin Luther King and had this interaction. And what could be more incredible when you think of the arc of the meaning of this distinctive institution, this university founded on the idea of social justice, that we would have folks sponsoring this event that we're interacting with Martin Luther King and then have today the grandsons of Nelson Mandela here with us for this keynote event. Brandeis said, the most important political office is that of the private citizen. If we desire respect for the law, we must first make the law respectable. If we would guide by the light of reason, we must let our minds be bold. Let our minds be bold. Think about that. This is a pretty radical notion for someone who ended up on the Supreme Court, not always known for boldness these days. But that was Brandeis. Brandeis was a believer that you could accomplish great things, you could be accomplished in your life and still make a difference in the world that those things were not mutually exclusive, that success did not mean you stopped giving back to the world. And our keynotes have really been about that. And I'm so grateful that our keynotes from last year, Eliza and Judy Dushku, are with us tonight. Thank you so much for coming back this year. In Kwaku and Indaba, we had a chance to talk a little bit at dinner. But you not only share a last name with a great anti-apartheid crusader, but you clearly share his commitment to making the world a better place. That commitment to helping others, no matter their background or wealth, is what it means to let your minds be bold. You know, students, you, students in the audience, you get to hear this quite frequently, but we have a lot of guests here. And we know President Lawrence tends to, at each orientation, at each welcome to the university, remind you that the Talmud teaches us that to those to whom much is given, much is expected. And many of you are used to me then hopping up immediately and saying, I thought that was Spider-Man. <laughs> With great power comes great responsibility. And both are true. Both are true. Tonight we honor that legacy. The legacy of our founders who believed that because we were here, because we had such tremendous opportunities, we had a tremendous obligation to make difference in the world, to make it better, to be part of the change we want to see in the world. I hope that hearing from Kwaku and Ndaba, we in this room who have been given so many advantages and opportunities are inspired even more to do for others, to be bold, in short, to be Brandeis. This event would not have been possible without the tireless efforts of those dice impactors we've mentioned several times, not to mention Marcy McPhee, and the ongoing leadership and commitment of our student government who stepped forth at the inception of Dice Impact to be a partner in this program. So before we hear from the Mandelas, it is my great pleasure to introduce Ricky Rosen of the great class of 14, the president of our student union and co-sponsor of Dice Impact. Ricky. Thank you, Dean Flagle. Thank you, Professor Williams. And thank you all for being with us here tonight at the annual Dice Impact keynote address. Now, before I have the pleasure of introducing our distinguished guest, the Mandelas, I would like to share a little bit about what Dice Impact is, why it matters, and why it speaks to the heart of who we are as Brandeis students and members of the Brandeis community. Several months ago, I participated in a roundtable discussion with a few other Brandeis undergraduate seniors. To get the process going, one woman asked us to tell her about what made Brandeis unique, 
about what set Brandeis apart from Boston College or Tufts University, all schools which, on paper, we are very similar to. Now, even having spent four years at this great university, immersed in this wonderful sea of people, I found myself at a loss for words. Luckily, one student, one student spoke up. What makes Brandeis special is the number of service-oriented clubs on campus. That's a good point, I thought. Another, another student stated, what makes Brandeis unique is the relationships between faculty and students and how you can have lunch with a faculty member whenever you want. He was definitely right too, but it wasn't quite what I was thinking. A third student shared their opinion. It's the fact that students run the campus and have a significant influence on university policy. Now, none of these students were wrong, but they weren't quite getting at what made Brandeis Brandeis. Finally, I spoke up. What makes Brandeis different from other schools is how unconventional we are. Now, let me explain. All of us stand by our beliefs with unwavering conviction, no matter what we believe in, and trust me, every one of us here believes in something. Brandesians are unconventional. We're more passionate about canvassing for state representatives than we are about 40 cent wing night at the local sports pub. We don't spend our weekends out springing from party to party, but instead collecting canned goods for impoverished communities, or giving our time to adults with developmental disabilities, or leading discussion groups on climate change, or telling stories about our perceptions of gender roles. What makes us most conventional, unconventional of all, is that we are proud of this fact. We don't deny it. We embrace it in an amusing and often self-deprecating way. And the result is that we know our identity as Brandesians, and we accept it. All of this stems from our university's commitment to social justice. Many students here have heard this phrase for years now and often scratch their head and wonder what it means to do social justice. Well, I don't have to tell you. You can see it for yourself here by being a part of Dice Impact. Dice Impact began in 2012 as a celebration of all of the incredible individuals, clubs, and organizations on this campus that devote themselves to equitable education, free speech, human rights, sustainability, equal opportunities, and dozens of other causes worth fighting for. And these people and groups don't just do this for one week. They do it year round. At the end of the day, social justice is not so much about saying, though, as it is about doing. If you went to any other university out there, I would imagine you would find groups on campus that stand for fair and equal treatment for all human beings. But here at Brandeis, we don't just stand for things. We move them actively. We have organizations that encourage students to write for rights or collect signatures on petitions that go straight to the Massachusetts State House, or in some cases, to Washington, D.C. If an ordinary college student encountered an injustice, I would imagine that they would try to ignore it, put it out of their mind, put their earphones back in, and blast the music just a bit louder. But doing nothing when faced with injustice is equivalent to passively perpetuating that injustice. As Beverly Daniel Tatum illustrated in her book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria?, this justice is equivalent to passively standing on a moving walkway at an airport. Individuals who are engaging in hateful behavior will stride along with the walkway towards the destination ahead. But even if you just stand idly by and try to ignore the individuals moving past you, you are still being pulled in that same direction. Here at Brandeis, students are encouraged, when faced with an injustice, to move in the opposite direction of the conveyor belt. Now, if you've ever tried running up an escalator that's going down, you know how challenging that can be. But as Nelson Mandela once said, it always seems impossible until it's done. It is not enough to simply post a Facebook status condemning poverty or criticizing white privilege. In that case, you're reacting to the injustice where you need to be proactive, present both physically and mentally. And look around at how many of you are present here tonight. This is what Dice Impact is all about. Now I am priv privileged and humbled to be here with you all tonight to introduce Kweku Mandela Amua and Nadaba Mandela, the, the grandchildren of Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, who you all know, the political activist, as Professor Williams said, the revolutionary, the champion of an entire continent, the role model for generations that have passed and generations that have yet to come. More than anyone else, Nelson Mandela embodied these values and ideals of social justice. Kweku and Nadaba are building on their grandfather's legacy by working to empower and inspire Africans across the continent. Nadaba and Kweku are co-founders of the Africa Rising Foundation, which you will hear is focused on instilling a sense of pride and purpose in young Africans 
in this critical time in Africa's development. Kwaku also works with Out of African Entertainment, which uses the medium of film to change the mindset of young Africans and challenge the prevailing perception in the global community. Many people living in the Western world have an incomplete understanding of Africa, and Kwaku and Adaba's objective is to show individuals worldwide the whole picture. Africa isn't just rising, it is booming. Africa is the fastest growing continent in the world. Africa's economy has exploded and technology is becoming readily available to everyone. Kwaku and Nadaba, through the Africa Rising Foundation, are aiming to make sure not only that Westerners are aware of the scope of Africa's ascension, but also that all Africans are educated about their past. After all, education is the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world, just as their grandfather did. But as I noted earlier, social justice necessitates action. Outside of the Africa Rising Foundation, Kwaku and Nadaba inspire others to join the fight for social justice in their local communities. They created the social network, or as they call it, the social change network, the Mandela Project, not only to honor the work of their grandfather, but to recognize and encourage everyday heroes and random acts of kindness in the world around us. As we look back on the illustrious achievements of their grandfather, we can draw inspiration from his courage and his unwillingness to look away when faced with injustice. But as we look to the future, which young Africans can now look to with optimism, we see hope in Kwaku and Nadaba's fight. And so I have the great pleasure of introducing to you tonight Kwaku Mandela Amua and Nadaba Mandela. Thank you. Hello, Brandis. Man, does it feel good to be here tonight. I want to thank uh, Marcy McPhee for bringing this all together with all of her unique and amazing students. I have to thank Andrew, the Vice President, for that warm introduction. Charles, you've been amazing. Uh, we're definitely going to stay in touch. <laughs> And Ricky, that was, uh, that was a really cool speech. You know, you, I think you hit the nail on the head, as they say in South Africa. So thank you. How is everyone feeling tonight? Good? All right. It's absolutely fantastic to kick off Impact Week with each of you. Brandis' finest. I want everyone to take a moment and look around you. Look to your left and look to your right. Behind and in front of you. Now, what do we all have in common? Each of us brings something unique to the table. Yes, but our DNA has a common thread, a thirst for social justice. It is this thread that strings us together today and in all the days ahead. As mankind, we have always defined ourselves by the few rather than the many. Our ability to become rich and powerful, to seek success and recognition has outweighed the collective and shared bond we each share on this earth. We found solutions to go to the moon and cure physical imperfections, to climb the highest mountains and travel overseas. We marvel in our daily techno technological feats from mobile phones to tablets, to social networks and apps that make our life more efficient. Yet in all our time on this planet, we have never answered the most basic of questions. How is it that every human can share in the most basic of rights? We know from our past that nothing is impossible. In fact, we know it always seems impossible until it's done. But surely if we can overcome two great world wars and find our liberation through a revolutionary war, if we can shatter the ceilings of racism and gender discrimination, if we can bring down apartheid to its knees, and if we can build on the track record set by our forefathers in the civil rights movement, and if life can still exist after every devastating earthquake, tsunami and flood, then there's hope for us yet. We make choices in life sometimes, intentionally, and other times at not. Here's a basic choice which I will ask you all to make. 
choose to find the balance in your life. We all want things in life, ultimately, but we also want to give back to our community. And in this day and age, our lives have become a contradiction. We aspire for greatness, but greatness comes in many forms. And often I think we feel we need to travel overseas to give back or have an impact. When you can have an impact in your neighborhood, in your family, amongst your friends. My grandfather once said in one of his last public appearances, friends, 20 years ago, the world hosted a historic concert which called for our freedom. Your voices carried across the oceans to inspire us in our prison cells far away. And tonight, we are free because of it. We are honored to stand before you and we celebrate you. But let us remind ourselves that our work is far from complete. Where there is still poverty and sickness, including AIDS, where human beings are being oppressed and willfully uh, subjected to oppression by democratic governments which turn a blind eye. Well, there is not much other to say to them than there is more work to be done. Our cause, our fight, our collective shared vision for freedom is still there to be fought by all. I say to you tonight, after nearly 90 years of life, it is time for new hands to lift the burden. It is in your hands. So the question is, where am I going? And it's something I ask myself almost every day. Each of us gets into our week, weekly routine and then our bam, there's that thought again, where am I going? It sneaks up on us, midway while brushing our teeth, just before we fall asleep, midway through a work shift or a lecture. That question, where am I going? If it's any constellation, I have this, I have this thought, like I said, every week since I can last remember. And maybe that isn't too comforting to you. Now that I think about it, because of many of the things that we do to a certain degree and hand, when I think about Brandis, I think about the degree to which magic can really happen at an institute like this. Because you're putting something that's so unique at the forefront of everything that you do. Des Impact is an audacious, bold undertaking. Brandis is unlike any other school whose goals are not beer and football, and students meet those goals. Here at Brandis, you have a choice, a goal, and that's social justice, in which you are destined to fail. No society has ever achieved it, but you remind us that each and every one of us can try. Des Impact is the best of who we are and what we aspire to be. There are plenty of people out there who say that you guys are living a dream. I've been blessed to feel that in various many ways throughout my journey, most recently with my nonprofit organization, Africa Rising, that we can achieve great things. We can have an impact on the next generation and we can change people's perceptions. So why then does the universe continue to whisper at us? Where am I going? Perhaps as a reminder that we are never quite at the destination, we constantly become more and think more and create more about how it is it that we can change our lives and those around us. My granddad had this saying. He said, no human was born hating. A human was taught to hate. And if a human can be taught to hate, then they can be taught to love. It's a simple idea, but it's an idea that can be turned into a spark. So when the idea of Africa rising and planting that first seed in the minds of young Africans came about, and let's think about it, you know, in his role as Dominic Cobb in 2010's film Inception, and I'm a filmmaker, so I usually quote films. Leonardo DiCaprio's character hits the nail on the head with this line. He leads into the architect and asks, what is the most resilient parasite? Bacteria, a virus, an intestinal worm? No, it's an idea. Cobb answered his own question. An idea is resilient. 
highly contagious. You see, once an idea has taken hold of the brain, it's almost impossible to eradicate. An idea, and particularly one that is fully formed, fully understood, and that sticks, really grips people. An idea is the match that lights our souls on fire. And ideas are one step in our search and thirst for social justice. For me, the idea of Africa rising is just that. I recently read an article in The Economist about a bleak observation on the US. Over the last 25 years, the US economy has boomed and then collapsed. Options in consumer goods grew exponentially while the number of consumers able to afford them shrunk. Despite political discourse on America's middle class, inequality has increased. In the last four years, 95% of all income gains have gone to the 1%, and I'm sure this is nothing new to most of you. Inequality is a choice, as Paul Crookman argued recently, and the United States provides a particularly grim example for the world because in so many ways, America often leads the world. If other Americans follow this example, it does not portend well for the future. Well, the United States, and I'm talking about all of us in this room today, has many wonderful ideas how we can improve the above observation. At the end of the day, we continually miss the mark. And the question is why? Because we are collectively missing the second ingredient in, in achieving social justice the intention. Without true intent, an idea is meaningless. My cousin and I started Africa Rising Foundation to begin a new narrative on our continent's emergence. And I know what you're thinking. In a continent where two out of three Africans are affected by poverty, can we actually say that Africa is rising? The numbers only show us one side of the coin, though. Africa's poor populations quantify quantities have doubled since the 1980s, and six countries in Africa hold the consistent title of the top 10 most equal countries in the world. But that doesn't mean we shouldn't have hope, that we shouldn't aspire for more, and believe that there will be a positive future. I strongly believe our youth holds the key to our continent. Our youth, and I mean you, all of you in this room, have two things we need and the world needs, innovative ideas and clear intention to bring about an end to the imbalances we see in our world. I'm often asked about my grandfather and if he was scared when he was in prison that he would never see the outside world again and that his dream of equality for all in our country would never, be, would never materialize. And he answered the question the same way every time when I asked him. He looked deep into my eyes with a slight smile painted on his heart and he'd say, Kwaku, many of the men and women who stood by my side always knew that we would defeat apartheid because each step we took was a step closer. They believed like each of us who strive for social justice that the world at heart was a better place than we let it be. Without their ideas, without their intention, without their steps to keep on pushing, Africa Rising would not exist. And I would not be standing here in front of you. This is exactly why Des Impact Week is all about understanding that sometimes what separates us is the exact ingredient we need to bring about global change. Social justice is more than a conversation. It's more than just inspiring people. It's more than just a keynote address. Achieving social justice takes blood, sweat, and tears. It takes chances. It takes risks. It's the answer to this question. Do we have what it takes? Do we have ideas? Do we have intention? Do we have enough fearlessness to take action in the face of any situation? I'd say together we do. I'd say together we can. And I say together we will. If not you, then who else? If not now, when? If not you, 
then who better than you? Our ideas will quench the world's thirst. Our intentions will quench the world's toughest problems. Our actions will be some of the world's most innovative solutions in the decades to come. So I ask you to say it with me. Ideas, intentions, actions. It is these three steps that will string us together for an even stronger future. And my goodness, I can't wait for our paths to cross. Now let's get to work. I thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge one of the pioneers that was acknowledged by Dean, Mr. Hemingway, for being a pioneer for many people of color. <laughs> Discrimination is the enemy of social justice. Discrimination is the enemy of social justice. Multinational companies mining gold in Australia on land that historically belongs to the indigenous people of Australia, known as the Aborigines, make billions of profits a year, and the people of the original nation get nothing, and the government says zero. That is discrimination. When Africans from North and West Africa and France are consistently harassed, victimized, searched on the streets by police, that is discrimination. When black people in Brazil are treated as second-class citizens and do not have equal opportunities to create businesses and to become part of the formal economy by the minority of white Brazilians, that is discrimination. When the American government support Israeli army in dispute over the land against Palestine, that is discrimination. When the government of Russia and China discriminate against people who possibly have HIV virus and do not allow them to come into their countries, that is discrimination. When my African people from Africa, the cradle of civilization, are seen as helpless, poor, backward, uncivilized people, unable to lead themselves. What is that? There is no question that I'm an African. When I walk on the streets, they don't say there's a Nigerian, a Malian, a South African. They say that is an African. So clearly, it is no wonder, and I am proud to stand up and tell you that my agenda is the African people. Continuously, in international media, we see Africa as a war dictator, poverty-stricken area. It constantly reinforces our people's inferior complex. We say, let us use the very same tool that they use against us. This is the tool that Africa Rising will use to tell our own stories from our own point of view. So 
So this year, 2014, we have come up with a campaign we call the African Dream, which we are proud to say we have partnered with the African Development Bank. The African Dream is yet to be defined. We all know what the American Dream is. And it has been able to pervade every single society today. Even Africans adopt the American dream. Unfortunately, they will not realize it because they are not American. In this campaign, we will take young people like yourselves, starting from high school, business leaders, priests, teachers, all the way up to your heads of state to collaborate and ask them a very simple question. What is the Africa that you want to see tomorrow? We will do this in no less than 20 African countries. Did you know that Africa is made up of 50 countries? Did you know that Congo has more than 400 languages? Did you know that Nigeria has more than 250 languages? These are two countries out of 54. Africa is the most diverse place on this planet. And yet, they want to compare us to China. 1.2 billion people who all speak the same language, same culture. I keep telling them, these are apples, these are oranges. Where do you start begin the comparison? At Africa Rising, we believe that we can play a vital role in creating leaders of tomorrow. Leaders who will genuinely look after the interest of their people and not the interest of their pocket. So another project which relates to this is one we call the African Rising Resource Center, a center in which youths in the rural villages will be able to come and get the knowledge, the expertise, the mentorship, the guidance needed to gain skills that will enable themselves to get employment, that will enable themselves to start successful businesses starting with a very important tool, being able to use a computer, which many of you today take for granted. The average South African today finishes high school without even touching a computer, without even touching a computer. So that is our number one goal, to increase computer literacy in the rural areas of South Africa. And from there, of course, we'll continue throughout the rest of the continent. So in essence, we are creating a new breed of African leaders that will enable the continent to develop from its own point of view. This is Africa rising. We talk about the Mandela legacy. This is the Mandela legacy. A man who fought and gave up his life for freedom. For freedom, not just for black people, but so people in his country can all be free and unite and have equal opportunities to go to school and not just reduce black people to being laborers. Black people are not just the best athletes. Black people can become scientists lawyers, attorneys, accountants, and so have you. So I was very touched once when I brought over yet another American artist to meet our grandfather. And this American artist came over, greeted the old man, and 
played the, the, the piano for him. As soon as he started playing the piano, my grandfather opened up the newspapers and had no interest whatsoever. I said, no, Grandad, no, no, Grandad, you can't do that. Please, please, just give him two minutes. Let me finish the song. He said, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> he finished the song, and he came over, and he thanked the, the old man, and he said, thank you for signing my book. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, et cetera, et cetera. And the old man said nothing to him. He turned to me, and on the paper, on the back page of the sports section, there was a picture of one of the famous rugby players. And he said, Ndaba, do you know who this is? And I said, yes, Grenade, it's Brian Habana. Plays rugby for the Springboks. He said, okay. And that was it. That's all he said that whole time. <laughs> and at first, I didn't get it. But later, I started to understand that, okay, the old man is trying to tell me, Ndaba, I keep meeting these American artists, and it's great. However, do you know your own African artists? And that reaffirmed to me that the work we're doing with Africa Rising was on the right path. The future leaders of Africa. That is me. That is some of you here today. I met Derek from Kenya. I met another gentleman from Sudan. And the only way we can do this, my brothers and sisters, is if we unite. If we do not unite, trust me, we shall continue fighting for decades to come. The only way we can do it is if we recognize the power that we have as a unit. Because together, with the sheer numbers that we have, we can achieve anything. Every year, there's approximately 90, I mean, sorry, there's approximately 900,000 children coming out of university, coming out of high school. But trust me, there's not 900,000 jobs to take care of those youth, to keep them busy. And this is not just a phenomenon in Africa. You saw what happened in the London riots. You see what's happening in Greece. This is a general thing that affects all youth. You saw what happened in New York when they were occupying Wall Street. This is happening across the world. So if our leaders do not take a keen interest in the youth and are able to provide programs that will curb the energy, that will be able to harness the energy so that they can use it for constructive ways to innovate programs and ways in which we can come together and create a much more united world. This is the only way. Because I say again, if this does not happen, the streets of London, of Johannesburg, of Kenya, of Greece, of Europe will burn. And I'm not advocating for violence. However, if these issues are not met, it is only a ticking time bomb. So, I would like to say to you, join me and my brother, Kweku. Let us make sure that we create a more united world. Through unity, we'll be able to understand each other's challenges. And by using the youth who have these ideas, who have this passion, we will be able to address any challenge that faces us today. But if we continue to live in our bubbles and high walls, then I'm afraid we will face doom. And that is why we created the Mandela Project. The Mandela Project was really a project inspired by Mandela Day. Mandela Day is a day that has been sanctioned in the United Nations, the official day being on his birthday, July 18th. 
and the simple concept that Nelson Mandela s served in the public service for 67 years of his life. And as a man that we all respect and appreciate and love, let us try to emulate this greatness by taking 67 minutes out of our day and giving it back to our communities. This is the simple premise of Mandela Day. Get out of your shell, get out of your cocoon, and find out what are the challenges that need to be met in your community. Again, creating a more united world. So, I say to you, young people, professors, teachers, I would love this year if we can have a Mandela Day right here at Brandeis University. And I'd like to end off by using my favorite quote from my grandfather. And he says, as we As we light our own fire, we unconsciously give others the power to light their fire. And all of you here at Brandeis Universities, I can see your fire is burning bright. So make sure you continue to do that so you can continue spreading that fire to the rest of the, the, the population, to your family, to your cousins, to those people that you're going to touch during Mandela Day. And remember, Mandela Day is not just on July 18th. Every day, any day, can be a Mandela Day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, these incredibly uh, powerful and, and inspiring words. Uh, I really want to get uh, uh, the community to engage in this, this conversation, uh, but I, I have to um, take it upon myself to, <laughs> to commandeer the, the, the start of the, the conversation. Uh, and I was really struck by, by both of your, your comments about what it means to, to be an African. I mean, there's a... Uh, a very modern vision, a very modern agenda uh, that you have uh, in terms of thinking about uh, your, your organization uh, and what you want to accomplish. But there's also this very powerful <coughs> historical resonance as well, this very um, uh, powerful awareness um, of the history um, of Africa and how it relates uh, to the present. So my, my question is, in some ways, very simple, but also very complex. In 2014, what does it mean for you uh, and uh, for your organization to be an African? Works. You want to talk? Sure. I mean, <clears throat> I'll, uh, I'll talk about my experience because I grew up in the States um, for the first 10 years of my life. But uh, I know going back to South Africa, it definitely made me feel like I was more in touch with the rest of the world. Um, and I think that's often because in the States, it's such a big place and you can become sheltered here. Um, and you don't get to see as much as the world here or know about as much as the world as you do in South Africa. And also South Africa was on uh, edge, you know, at the time I returned. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of unknowns. Um, and to see a country transition like that is, is not something that people get to do uh, every day. I think for, for me, uh, being an African, uh, particularly in a modern day society, uh, the one thing that stands out is definitely pride. Yeah. Um, you know, Africans were the first people, the first civilizations. We created the first technologies. And these are things that are not readily shared um, with people. 
but they're things to be proud of. Um, a lot of the confidence issues that Africa has uh, come from ultimately the fact that our history is distorted at the end of the day, and it hasn't been documented. And so for me, it's important, it's really important as a filmmaker to tell these stories, but just as a right. citizen. Um, and I think this extends to you know, everyone in this room at the end of the day. Uh, there's a warmth and, and, and just a uniqueness when you go to Africa and you see people that don't have the luxuries that we you know, uh, are able to have in, in places and in, you know, cities like Boston and Massachusetts, um, but that enjoy life ultimately and uh, you know, would do anything for their community at the end of the day yeah. and seek happiness um, as kind of a pillar of their life. So mm -hmm. um, I think as a modern African, there's so much for us to take forward and share with the world. And you know, I'm, I'm hoping to, one, educate Africans um, how to better do that, mm -hmm. uh, but also educate the world how to better interact with Africa. Right. Yeah. I mean, for me, an African is somebody who is in touch with their roots, their background. Mm -hmm. They know where they come from. An African is somebody who respects their culture. Mm. And one of the oldest rules is to respect your elders. You know, one thing that we do back at home is we, we hang out with our elders, mm. the elderly men in our village. Right. We sit with them, they tell us stories, we laugh, we drink beer, whiskey, <laughs> you know? Yeah. That is what we do as Africans. Someone who is proud of where they come from. Mm -hmm. You know, there's many of us who had to go through struggles because of colonialism and the apartheid movement. Right. Many of our parents did not have access to education and ended up becoming maids working in the kitchen, mm -hmm. working in the gardens, cleaning pools right. for the privileged. And despite that, you are proud of your parents mm -hmm. because you understand the circumstance and the context of where you come from. Right. Mm -hmm. This is what being a proud African is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I certainly appreciate that. And I mean, what's so powerful about what both of you are saying is that it's a, it's a universal story as well. Yeah. Right? I mean, you can apply uh, these, uh, these challenges, you know, that... Uh, that you're speaking to, uh, to challenges that exist for oppressed peoples all over the world. Mm -hmm. uh, whether we're talking about Africa, whether we're talking about the United States. Exactly. Um, it, it's really a, an international and, and a diasporic story uh, as well. Uh, so I really uh, appreciate uh, both of those comments. Um, let's see, we have microphones set up uh, for people to, to ask questions uh, to uh, Kwaito and Damba. Uh, so I would like to, to open it up to the, to the audience uh, and to, to give you a chance to engage with our uh, esteemed guests. So uh, please don't be shy. Come on, Brandeis folks. I know you're not shy. <laughs> All right, so we have a, a question over here to my left. Yeah, so I have a question from a pragmatic standpoint in terms of economic development or empowerment. To what extent do you think it's useful to have sort of a pan-African identity or to look at Africans sort of not by state or nationalistic lines? Because obviously when you look at other continents or other parts of the world, typically we don't break it down you know, in such a broad way. So do you think looking at it in that way is constructive or do you think looking at Africa as a monolith can sometimes cue into the harms that are often causing these problems in the first place? Well, Africa is a vast place. There's so many different cultures there, there's so many different languages. I think you would be robbing each and every individual country, even the smallest countries like the one that exists inside of South Africa, Swaziland and Lesotho, <laughs> um, of their heritage, um, which is rich, you know? Uh, and I think there's a need for more collective unity ultimately, uh, potentially for us to share um, one monetary system, right? like the Afro, which uh, I believe <laughs> they want to create for 2028. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, you know, like the states, ultimately, um, each state is very different, right? Uh, what people do out here in New England, they definitely do, don't do out in Texas. Um, <laughs> and so you want to kind of uh, keep your, your sense of independence. 
Um, so I could never see Africa melding into one, but I could see it unifying on a lot of levels um, into one at the end of the day. And that's something that uh, I think we're all very confident will happen in the near term future. Um, but it has to be propelled by the youth. Yeah, and um, you know, historically we have to break down those barriers that were created by colonialists because you know, all those lines and borders that you see were not created by African people. You know, those were cre created by the colonial powers. Mm -hmm. you know? And typically what they did is that they separated tribes and villages that were allies. Yes. And they separated you know, and yeah. divided and ruled. Yeah. That's what they Ar did. Arbitrary division. Of course. Right. So yeah. it's very important at the very same time. As much as we want to acknowledge each country's, each tribe's, you know, culture, language, customs, etc., we also must have a pan-African view of where we want to go as a people, as a continent. Mm. Not just in Africa, but as a people across the world. You go to China today, there's a place called Chocolate City, <laughs> filled with Nigerians and the Africans from across the border. Mm -hmm. It's like Chinatown. There's a Chinatown in every country. <laughs> and Nigerians are starting that movement. You know? So we need to have very much value our customs, mm -hmm. but moving forward as a united people. So it's a combination. Okay. Uh, yeah, microphone over here. And if you do have a question, please step up to one of the microphones. Uh, so to my right. Hi. Um, my question is specific to Africa Rising. And just as an African in the diaspora, having my education here, I find it difficult. I find like a big problem is going back home and being sort of well integrated. Because you come here and you're exposed to so many different things. So I'm just wondering how Africa Rising is is going to allow us to be integrated back into Africa and back home and how we can make a change. Because I find it so hard to go back. And I guess the difference is opportunity, because people feel that there's so much opportunity here, and which is lacking back home. So I'm wondering, like, as much as Africa Rising is about developing, you know, going into communities in African countries and giving to people back home, I think that us in the diaspora connecting with people who haven't gone out, I don't know, that would be a powerful thing together. So I just wonder how you're looking at bringing people who are outside back home to connect, to grow, to do what it is that Africa Rising is about. Okay, yeah, perhaps one. I mean, speak to I would say this, that's an, uh, really an individual thing. Uh, I think we could definitely explore that amongst the media campaign, but one of the things you'll find is you'll go home and like you said, there's not, <coughs> that much um, opportunity there at the end of the day. But that is an opportunity, particularly for someone that's been able to come out here, study, gain skills that are much needed, and take those home. But my granddad always had uh, a saying, ultimately. He said, um, if you speak to a man in his language, you speak to him in his heart. And you could take that as if you go back home, ultimately, you have to bring yourself to the level of your people. You know, You can't maintain this lifestyle that you were living over here. You can't expect them to have the same interests that you had over here um, or that you're going to be the same person. Uh, so it's really about adapting, ultimately, mm -hmm. and understanding you know, your people's needs, uh, your people's culture, where they're at uh, in that specific country. And you know, sometimes it is difficult. I know it was difficult for me when I went back. Um, but I think it's one of those things, it's about understanding, right? It's about any great movement or change in the world um, and I just you know, finished working on a film which we showed at Sundance recently about kind of people from two different paths ultimately. How do you get them to understand each other? It takes time and it's dialogue between two people ultimately. It's them figuring out that they're not so different after all. And I think, I mean I'm sure you already know that about your country but it's like going back and you know, they're here and you're here, right? Um, but it's only in your mind that it's actually like that. Like if you give it time, if you go through that process of understanding, you'll realize that you have so much in common with them, ultimately. Uh, and the impact that you can have, uh, that's the greatest thing, so. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, yeah go ahead. I just want to break down that misconception, you know, and just be honest with you, my sister, is that um, 
Africa actually has a lot of opportunity, much more, 10 times more than America and Europe combined. The problem is that when you go back home and you are seeking employment, that's where you'll find challenges. Africa is looking for entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. people who want to take the risk to start businesses that do not exist. There's a large gap in Africa, you see. So being an entrepreneur is not easy. It takes patience, it takes perseverance. You know, you have to be persistent. And it's not going to happen overnight. These are where the real opportunities are. The guys who are taking the risk are the guys who are going to benefit the most. Mm -hmm. This is where the opportunities are. And what Greg was saying is 100%. You have to be able to humble yourself. You know, when I go back home to the Eastern Cape, you know, we've got a big house there. And across the road, the guys, they live in small houses and huts. All they want to see is me coming to their house, chilling in their house, having a drink, putting on music and chatting. Just that alone, may, let me tell you, the amount of respect they have for me is amazing because they say, no, you know Ndaba, he comes from Joburg, from the big city. When he comes home, he sits with us, he drinks with us, he talks with us. That's all they want, hmm. nothing more than that. But if you wanna go home and sit in your big house, and watch your big TV, and drive your big car, and you don't want to look at the small people, <laughs> then you're going to have a problem, sister. Question in uh, the middle. Um, good evening. I had a question more d related directly to your grandfather and his legacy, in that um, I think one of the more captivating things about Nelson Mandela was that he said that he was fighting for democratic participation in South Africa for everyone. And um, I think the situation that's unfolding now in South Africa is that we can see a more vibrant democracy, but along the way we see the ruling party, there's been scandal after scandal. So can you kindly comment, if you can, on um, what your thoughts are and what you think his thoughts are on this situation unfolding will be? Well, you know, the contemporary political situation. In I South mean, Africa. when you look at any typical uh, one-party state, you know, that develops over years, you will see that uh, it's very typical of that one party that rules, you know, just after, just after liberation, is that they become complacent and lazy, and you see more and more corruption. That happens in Russia, in China, everywhere you go. It's the same thing that's happening. It's not special to South Africa. You know, and the biggest issue is that the ANC has not been able to transform themselves from a revolutionary party to a governing party. You know, and that's where the biggest issue is. And that lies within the leadership. Mm -hmm. And it's the leadership who are now 60, 70 years old, 80 years old, who are, have that fight with the colonial powers and are stuck to that fight of colonial powers that are not able to transform. So they will never admit that they're wrong because in their mind, they're still fighting the West. Mm. And that is where the youth are very key. And that is why we need more and more youth to participate in politics and to get involved and to rise and be able to take up the baton. But the youth are seeing corruption and they're seeing complacency and they're doing the opposite and running away. Instead, they should be going inside to take over. Mm. I would agree with Ndaba. I don't think you can ever fight a system from the outside. Um, and I would say that in South Africa's uh, context, ultimately, we're still extremely young. You know, we're only 20 years of, of true democracy. Years, if you look at America, you know, you guys have had hundreds of years, ultimately. And those uh, first 20 years were kind of rough. I'm sure there, there were you cowboys, <laughs> you know, fighting. So there you go. Um, but I'd also say, and I say this to a lot of people, you know, uh, politics is a really interesting thing because. I think every politician starts off with the best intentions, right? They want to do good for their community. They want to do good for their nation. They m might want to do good for the world. But as you grow in politics and you realize you need to get supporters, you need to market yourself ultimately, you need money, uh, you begin to compromise. And once you open those floodgates, it's so hard to say morally correct, mm -hmm. right? To stay on the straight and narrow. And I think that's what you've seen in South Africa ultimately, and you've seen a lot of uh, mm -hmm. countries around the world. I think there's a general, look at London, or I should say England, <laughs> look at England ultimately. Uh, and basically the London riots they had two summers ago, right? That was young kids basically saying they're tired of the government, right? They're tired of the powers that be. 
um, and creating a collective voice to basically shut down the government for you know, two to three days. And that's the power we have ultimately as a population. We just forget it sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so important, like Ndaba said, that we get involved in politics, that we don't run away from it, right? Because if we do it with enough voices, then they will have to hear us. And I think in South Africa, that's what you're seeing. You're seeing young people starting to you know, find their voice ultimately and starting to think, you know what? I actually have to get engaged. Because if I don't and I allow this to continue, you know, what's going to happen in the next 20 years? Hi there. First of all, thank you for speaking with us this evening. Uh, a lot of what you guys said I know resonates with us as Brandeis students and in general, but a lot of what we are as being Brandesian or here as Dice Impact is that we're very activist in nature. And I feel as if what we were talking about here is just talking. Is there anything that you guys can suggest to us to, to almost hone into that activist side that resonates within each of us? How, how and what can we do? here in America to make sure that Mandela's legacy permeates throughout the entire world. Firstly, can I just say, I like your haircut. That's an activist haircut right there. <laughs> <laughs> so, no, but, uh, yeah. I think part of what he's speaking to is finding your voice, yeah. right? And, and how, do you, how do you balance the, the responsibility, right, that comes with being a Brandeis student, that comes with carrying the Mandela name, but also finding your distinct voice uh, and your, your place you know, in the work of social justice. You know, I think it's a balance ultimately, and I, I think you have to find that, I talked about that a little bit, right, is the fact that you wanna have an iPhone ultimately, you wanna have you know, a MacBook Air, you wanna be able to surf the internet and be on Facebook, but at the same time you wanna give back, right? And that's a contradiction because we know there's you know, over four billion people living on less than $3 a day. So it's like, how do you find that balance? How do you get engaged with something, uh, whether it's on a daily basis, a weekly basis, a monthly basis, that starts to do that, right? It starts to inform people in your communities. What I've always found, uh, particularly with volunteerism, and let's take Mandela Day for that instance. At first, I only really wanted to do it because it was the day named after my granddad. So I was like, okay, you know, I'm gonna go and, and volunteer ultimately. And once I did it, I was invigorated by it. But that's the problem we have with society today right, is most people don't even want to try things, even though they would feel, you know, a sense of gratification, right, a sense that they're giving back and changing their communities. And so I think for people, you know, or young people, particularly from Brandis ultimately, who engage with this on a day to day, it is really up to you to go educate people in your family, your friends, and in your community, right, and get engaged, whether that's creating your own campaign or petition ultimately, that's writing a policy, that's taking an urban development plan to your local mayor. Like, there's so many ways that you can interact with society right now and really build a strong voice. Um, so I think, like I said, it starts with an idea and then it starts with your intent. You know? And what is your intent, ultimately? If it's to change your community, then make it that. If it's to change your, you know, your nation, then make it that. If it's to change the world, then do that. There's nothing stopping you, ultimately. Yeah, and um, you know, Madiba's generation, they fought to break the physical chains, you know, and they broke the physical chains, and they were free. But the reality is that men mentally, there are still chains upon African people. There are still chains upon people in general because they don't know who they are. We coast along, we float along, you know, from concert to party to class, to a friend's house, bottle store, etc., etc., etc. We're just coasting, <laughs> you know? And we talk about these issues, but do we do anything about it? You know? We don't do anything about it. And Greg will say, idea, content, action, intent, and action. You know, you need to find like minded people like yourself who are passionate about cancer, about HIV, about orphans, whatever the issue may be. Find those like-minded people, get together, and decide what you're going to do. And do it. That's it. <laughs> Thank you. When does an intellectual become a warrior? When does he stop sitting in his armchair, gets up, and looks at fear in the eyes and say, sit down? When in your life, in many of our lives, 
we have and we will face this. For you, for the face of your grandfather, the face of your flag, when has someone told you to shut up and you just shake your head? <laughs> That's quite a question there, huh? I don't know. I was a bit of a bully in school, so no one ever told me to shut up. But, um, <laughs> no, look, I think, you know, trying to be a filmmaker, a lot of people told me I, I couldn't do that. Um, one, I was African. Two, I was black, ultimately. Um, but you fight against those things, and you have to believe in yourself, ultimately. Um, I think about some unique guys that we work with and that we know. Um, there's a guy called Hugh Evans who ran Oxfam and Make Poverty History in Australia, and his whole thing was about ending extreme poverty. And he could have stayed in Australia, you know, kind of been a mini celebrity, work towards alleviating poverty and sending money to organizations, or he could come to you know, the center of the world, essentially to a lot of people in New York City, um, and create a unique event which got you know, governments and private corporations to make commitments each year right, to ending extreme poverty by 2030. And he basically did that. He came here with no money and his wife, ultimately. He had no plan how he was gonna activate this. Basically, two months before the event, he met a guy who was like, you know what, I've been thinking about this as well. You know, I actually wanted to do a concert in Central Park. Why don't we do it together? And in two months, they basically organized the first Global Citizen Festival in Central Park. They got Foo Fighters to play for free. They got Neil Young to play for free. They got the Black Keys to play for free, ultimately. And they just did that with sweat and grind, you know? They knew what was not, they didn't know what was coming the next day, basically, right? But they believed in the idea. And they executed on it. So I think overcoming that fear can always be a big thing, particularly if people are telling you there's no way you can do this. And a lot of people tell us that, like, you're never going to change Africa. We're never going to, you know, get rid of poverty, ultimately. I mean, you know, the work that Judy does, how are you going to change a kid who's been indoctrinated to be a child soldier? But it's possible, right? We see that every day. I think there's very few things that can't change. Probably the only thing that can't change is the epidemic and the NBA with tattoos. But everything <laughs> else, everything else can change. I'm telling you that. Thank you. Yeah, um, yeah, even myself, you know, I used to work for an investment bank uh, called Investec in South Africa. And I was there for about a year. And um, you know, I come from a political background, studied politics, and I always wanted to be in economics. But after being a year in investment bank, I just realized that it's, it wasn't for me, you know. Uh, but I had to try it because I just, I just needed to try it, you know, because I, need, I, thought, I felt it was a balance. But after being there for a year, I realized, uh -uh, actually, this is not for me, you know. And I left. And I said, I'm going to go work on Africa Rising. And my family, Kwego's mother, you know, all, my, all the elders were like, Nabo, you're crazy. What are you doing? You have a good salary. This is a good job. You're going to make lots of money. <laughs> You know, and I just, I, I woke up every day going to work, dreading it. You know, you're at work in the morning, looking forward to lunch, <laughs> you know. At lunchtime, you go back to your desk. Now you're looking forward to five o'clock when you have to knock off, you know. And every day, then you're now looking to f forward to the weekend. So you're just living for the weekend now, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I was just miserable, you know. So ultimately, I just said, you know what, stuff it. I'm gonna go and follow my passion, and that's Africa Rising. And that's, that's, that's it, man, you gotta talk to yourself. You know, because at the end of the day, it's you sitting in front of that desk, not your mom. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Even though she's only a phone call away, <laughs> ready, ready to harass you, but. Uh, um, all right, how about in the-, in the Hello. Room? Um, hi, my name is Vincent Hassanti. I'm from Ghana. I was born there. Um, I think Indaba mentioned some of the simplicity of our lifestyle and how we enjoy some basic things like, you know, just going outside, you find a group of people, and then you start a soccer game. You put, like, two stones, like you make a pose, and then you just, like, start playing right away. Mm -hmm. um, and then one of the things that came to uh, my mind uh, during this, this su the summer of this year was that I wanted to go back and improve like the quality of play 
that means like if there's a a playground can i add like let's say a seat on the side so that when you play you when you get tired you could sit there and just like relax or if there could be a post that would be much nicer than what would we usually make uh, every day like to be able to have like a good time or a good play time so my my main question is um what is the shortest route to join Africa Rising? <laughs> Sign them up. Sign them up. <laughs> you know, we're starting, uh, we're going to start membership this summer um, in Africa. And, uh, you know, we're encouraging people just basically to, you know, come and give us their details. What's interesting about everything you just said is that last week at the UN, we launched a partnership. Uh, with about 30 of the top NFL players uh, who all committed to support a project that we're using football, uh, soccer over here. <laughs> uh, we're using soccer to spread awareness on HIV and AIDS. Um, and we're going to launch that at the FIFA World Cup. But as part of that, we're going to do a tour, doing mini soccer tournaments. And one of the places we're obviously going to go, because they've qualified in the World Cup, is Ghana. Um, and so we'd <laughs> love to work with you on that. Um, as part of that, we're going to be distributing yeah. 10,000 indestructible soccer balls in each country that we go to. Um, which, as you know, it's not always easy to have a ball that doesn't pop, right? Nah. So, uh, yeah, please come up to us after this. Let's connect and let's go from there, bud. I know we could be here all evening. We have time for one more question. Uh, so no pressure whatsoever, <laughs> but uh, oh, please. <laughs> um, hi, thanks for being here tonight. Um, I was really struck by how much respect you have for youth. Um, I also b believe that youth like have the drive, energy, and innovation, um, and boldness that is lacking in a lot of our appointed leaders at every level, like you mentioned. Um, so as w I would love to hear a little bit about um, like youth leadership in Africa Rising, some challenges that you've had, um, some things that have been successful, um, anything you can say about youth culture, like how you help empower youth, what are some programs, like are there arts, are there games, like Vincent was talking about play, how does all this um, kind of come together, and so what are some challenges and successes that you've had with that? Feel free to go first. <laughs> <laughs> that was a difficult question. Um, well, one of our key pillars um, in Africa Rising is celebrating African culture, uh, which obviously is mainly music and dance and that kind of thing. So uh, this year we're going to be putting on together a, a, a concert, um, you know, in celebration of the legacy of our grandfather. And we're also going to be running competitions, um, you know, on the local rural area level where kids will have the opportunity to get into a competition and the winners will then be able to perform on these big stages with, with next to you know big artists. Um, we also do a annual a sports uh, sort of tournament uh, also in the, uh, in the in the Eastern Cape uh, in our village. Uh, I mean many of the kids out there do not even have soccer balls you know they have teams where guys are playing barefoot and other guys are, pl are, are using cleats. You know, um, so I guess, you know, using sports and music and culture, I think that's one of the places where we've been uh, uh, more successful. Uh, but I think some of the challenges is then, you know, more concrete organizational structure uh, kind of things and administrative things. You know, you go to the, in our country, we have a uh, institution called SARS, the South African Revenue Services, which basically give um, status to um, to organizations like ourselves, uh, the tax benefit uh, sort of certificate. But for education, yes, you get it. But then for entrepreneurship, because um, we wanted to run competitions where kids come in with business ideas and then the winner will give them a grant to start that business. And it's been difficult because they don't want to acknowledge us for that. They only say, if you're giving more than, I think it's, a, it's equivalent of $100, which is a thousand rand, then you don't qualify, you know, to to be an entrepreneurship thing. And you say, but what is a guy going to do with a hundred dollars? How is he going to start a business with a hundred dollars? So it's just some of the administrative bureaucracy that exists, you know, uh, with NGOs, uh, because obviously in the past people have become very corrupt and using these NGOs for their own personal benefit. 
So there's a lot more regulation and bureaucracy and red tape around new uh, organizations such as ourselves. I mean, we are only four years old, and you know, there's some certain um, uh, things where only you have to be five years old uh, to, to qualify for that. So, you know, those are some of the uh, difficulties that we've had. I mean, I would just add to Ndaba, I think, um, like you said, music uh, and kind of film, art, uh, culture, those are universal things, you know. I'm, uh, I'm quite a big proponent of going to, like, concerts by myself. And one of the things I always find unique is, like, when you go to the concert and it, everyone's, like, queuing up and getting drinks at the bar and whatever, you feel kind of lonely, right, if you're there by yourself. But as soon as that band starts playing, you feel like you're a part of something. Right? Like you've connected with everyone else in that room. Um, and it's that that we're trying to foster, you know. Uh, I think it's something youth identify with so easily, so readily. Um, it's just for us as, you know, I don't even know what we are. I don't know if we can still call ourselves young adults or if we're like fully full adults <laughs> now. But um, I'm going to say young adults. As young adults that, you know, we can help to empower the generation, you know, that's coming next you know, our little brothers and sisters, ultimately. Um, and so that's kind of the thing we straddle with. And it's been difficult, ultimately, because you're learning every day. Um, and also, you have to influence them against, you know, kind of, I would just say, the commercial pop culture, right? Um, which is so attractive right now, at the end of the day. Like, I watch some of these music videos, and I'm like, damn, I want to be in that. You know, so it's like, <laughs> you really, you really struggle with that ultimately. And I've seen it with like some of our cousins ultimately, you know, and Dava's younger brothers. It's like right now they're in that like EDM phase and like wearing tight tops, you know, and like <laughs> going to the parties. Um, and the whole thing we're trying to foster with them at, at their own pace, because you don't want to force anyone to do anything. It's like, hey, just be a little bit more conscious each day. Like realize what you're doing, realize who you're hanging out with and where you're going, you know? Um, and they are learning because they're smart kids at the end of the day. Um, so yeah, I would say for us, what we've identified is that definitely uh, music, arts, and culture has got to be at the forefront of empowering youth. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. You can do one more. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Oh, nice. Oh, okay. I was going to say. <laughs> so as a small token of our appreciation and on behalf of Brandeis University, we would like to present Ndadaba and Kwaku with their very own Dice Impact sweatshirts. <laughs> Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. You guys know what they're so inspiring to us. So. Huh? No, they're so inspiring to us. They've done the work. <laughs> just before we close it's come to my attention that there are so many of you that we didn't have enough of these pink raffle tickets slash uh, evaluations for you so I'm going to put them up here on on the table if you didn't get one please fill it out give us some uh, some feedback on how we can make next year's Dice Impact keynote even better and you'll notice at the bottom the raffle prizes. So if you want one of these sweatshirts, yeah. autographed by Kwaku and, and Nadaba, um, as well as a couple of second prizes of a book for which Nadaba wrote the foreword that's autographed by both of them, and some um, Ghanaian bracelets for men and women. So uh, fill those out, give us some feedback, and leave them at the back. But I'll leave these unfilled out ones at the front. And uh, Nadaba and Kwaku have graciously agreed to uh, pose for photographs and, and have conversations upstairs in the green room. So we would ask you to um, to make a line as you go up the, the stairs this way, and uh, we'll see how long their stamina lasts for yeah. as many of you who would like to say hello. But thank you. I, I, well, that is true that Eliza set a record last year, but um, and and uh, particularly for the one who asked uh, for the question the question about so what can we do? Um, 
I appreciate the, the response, find like-minded people, decide what you want to do and do it. The Dice Impactors anticipated that question, and <laughs> on your seat is what you can do with 10 minutes, an hour, an afternoon, a summer. Um, so uh, find some like-minded people, look around as, as we were instructed to do, uh, decide what you're going to do and do it. Thank you for being here. Thank you.